Battle Shonen is quite the interesting genre within the manga and anime industries. On the surface, the idea of a shonen series seems quite simple. A series directed at males for males. Shonen literally translate to boy, after all. However, we've seen how a genre can transcend its original purpose and reach far beyond its supposed target audience. These days, shonen manga and anime are a household name in the entertainment industry for people across all ages, gender identifications, and walks of life. Of course, there are series with traditionally shoujo themes, or at least themes associated with a female audience, that also have great popularity amongst male readers and viewers. But that's a topic for its own video. Today, I want to focus on the battle shonen genre of anime and manga. Battle shonen, I suppose, can be considered a subgenre of the broader shonen category. When I say battle shonen, I mean series that fall under the shonen categorization, that emphasize fighting, superpowers, and solve the majority of problems through combat. These elements of storytelling are commonly associated with male audience members, because the social perception is that those are the stories guys like. And naturally, a majority of those viewers will assume that those series they love would be made by other men. And most of the time, they are. Many people cite the creation of Dragon Ball in 1984 to be the beginning of a new era in Battle Shonen, which changed the conventions and style of the genre forever. So this discussion will be going forward from 1984 to the present. When the genre exploded in international popularity in the 90s and early 2000s, the biggest series out there were made by men. Akira Toriyama's Dragon Ball, Yoshihiro Togashi's Yu Yu Hakusho, Nobuhiro Watsuki's Roroni Kenshin, Eiichiro Oda's One Piece. However, there was a series that started in 1996 that wouldn't make much of a splash as soon as it started, but created a ripple that forever changed the genre in the long run. Rumiko Takahashi had been in the manga game for a long time. She actually had done other shonen manga in the past, and although Inuyasha was already popular before, Inuyasha's anime adaptation in 2000 helped her series reach international acclaim. Inuyasha became a gateway anime for many new anime fans around the world, and even today, over 10 years after the series ended, it is one of the most iconic series in both anime and battle shonen history. One of Inuyasha's main strengths was its combination of shoujo and shonen plot elements to create a series that she thought both sides of the traditional gender divide would enjoy. And that seemed to work. Inuyasha is a series that is held in relatively high regard for both its romantic themes and its characters overall. Inuyasha had, and still has, a place in the conversation of the battle shonen classics, alongside household names like Dragon Ball, Naruto, One Piece, Bleach, and Yu Yu Hakusho. It seems like the international success of Inuyasha inspired many other female mangaka who were fans of shonen or battle shonen to try their hand at their own series with hopes of success. One of those creators was Hiromi Arakawa. She began publishing Full Metal Alchemist in 2001, with two very well-regarded anime adaptations in 2003 and 2009 respectively. While Takahashi seemed to pave the way for female mangaka to give Battle Shonen a shot, Arakawa went a step further and obliterated a few social perceptions about female authors and readers in the manga industry. The biggest strength of Full Metal Alchemist was the subject material it delved into, tackling issues like nationalism, genocide, militarism, science versus creationism, and this is where our not-so-good friend stereotypes comes into play. In conventional perception, people believe that women are not interested in those kinds of complex topics of that scale, and would rather concern themselves with romance, sex, and maybe magic. While we know this isn't true, many series aimed at a female readership or viewership will limit themselves to those latter aspects of storytelling, and many female manga bought into that idea and limited their own series to those elements. Now, I don't want to imply that those aspects associated with female readership and viewership are somehow lesser, because they aren't. Even series that stay within those lines can have a lot to say about society and the self. Stories like that are in no way less significant. It all depends on how the author approaches it, and how much care they put into the series. But we all know that female authorship and readership is just as diverse as men's, and nobody should have to limit themselves to a certain set of topics if they don't want to, especially if they have other things to say. Haromi Arakawa has helped dissolve the popular perception of female authors in collective anime fandom. Full Metal Alchemist remains one of the best written and most thought-provoking works of fiction, potentially in all of entertainment, not just in anime and manga. 
I also think it's important to note the motivations and inspirations behind these series. Rumiko Takahashi and Hiromi Arakawa didn't seem to make their series out of any sort of political or social motivation. Both of them have noted how they grew up reading and watching many series, and simply wanted to create manga after developing a passion for it. When asked if she was felt like she was making a change in the manga industry, Rumiko Takahashi had this to say, In any event, the first reason I make manga is because it's fun. My thinking is that if you read it and you find it fun, then that's the most important aspect. That's the beginning. It's not just joy of life, but that feeling of childhood. I've always kept it in mind that it's fun when you're reading it, and that's what manga is to me. She cited works like Dororo, Ashita no Jo, and Devilman as series that she enjoyed growing up, alongside some shoujo manga she read. She said that Inuyasha was born of a desire to make her own action-adventure series. She didn't really go into the manga business with the express purpose of being a trailblazer in the industry for women. She simply had a diverse set of series that she enjoyed, and those inspired her to try her hand at manga, and she did so very successfully. In turn, one of the people that she inspired was Hiromi Arakawa, who is an extremely popular mangaka in her own right and not just for Fullmetal Alchemist. She commented on the growing number of female shonen mangaka in the industry today. There were female readers who found those shonen very entertaining and often more interesting than the usual shoujo manga, which are manga marketed to young women and girls. Ten years later, we were old enough to draw, and so we made boys manga. This explains the series' increased number of female drawers in this area. Now, these answers from both mangaka might seem plain, especially when you consider how revolutionary their respective works are for the battle shonen genre. But I think that in itself has a very important message within them. The message is simple yet rarely fully comprehended by those in the entertainment industry. People's tastes in entertainment is diverse and varied, no matter who they are. It is true that society can push people in certain directions in terms of what they choose to watch, read, buy, or interact with, but absolutely nobody is locked in place as soon as they're born, regardless of what their way of life becomes. Despite societal pressures, people have autonomy and very rarely will the same two people go about dealing with those pressures in the same way. Some people just become comfortable with convention, others hide their true feelings on those conventions, others actively will oppose it as a sort of political statement, and others just don't care regardless of what the world says for or against how they live their lives. Takahashi and Arakawa's diverse interests in entertainment helped them go into the manga industry doing exactly what they wanted to do, making the stories they wanted to make. The idea of shonen being purely for males and shoujo being purely for females meant very little to them. They liked what they liked and that was it, and that translated into their own works. This message can go all ways. Your gender, way of life, race, or sexual orientation doesn't and shouldn't limit what you see and can create. There are male mangaka and writers out there who have made things typically associated with female viewership in the last 20 or so years. Things like Azumanga Daio, Madoka Magica, Little Witch Academia, and they've done it successfully. Like I said, the flip side of this video's subject deserves its own video, so I won't go too far into it. It just goes to show that anybody can make anything if they have the passion, dedication, and interest for it. Anyway, that three year span in which Inuyasha and FMA were being adapted into anime seemingly sparked a revolution in female battle shonen authorship. While the battle shonen genre remains a male centric one in terms of authorship, a battle shonen made by a woman breaking into international success has become a pretty regular occurrence in the genre for the last 20 plus years. Katsura Hoshino's The Grey Man is a well-received series, Akira Amano's Hitman Reborn is a manga that I know has a cult following in the West, and while it's not crazy popular internationally as far as I know, I want to shout out Peacemaker Kurogane, which was made by female mangaka Nanai Krono. It's actually one of my favorite anime and I wish more people would see it. But anyway, perhaps the other biggest hits in Battle Shonen created by women in the 2000s are Yana Toboso's Black Butler and Kazue Kato's Blue Exorcist, which are both still being published. The 2010s saw series like Shinobu Otaka's Magi gain international success, and Noragami, a manga created by a two-woman team by the collective name Adachi Toka, is also a major work in Battle Shonen fandom. And while I'm sure it wasn't very popular in Japan, Dead Man Wonderland is another series that kind of has its own cult following outside of Japan. It's written by Jinsei Kataoka, and it started in 2007, but got an anime adaptation in 2011. So I suppose it can be added to the 2010s category. A current battle shonen manga that is steadily on the rise is Jujutsu Kaisen, created by Gege Akatami, but perhaps the biggest female created work of battle shonen that has capped off the 2010s is Kimetsu no Yaiba which already had a dedicated fanbase for its manga before its 2019 anime adaptation, but has exploded even further into popularity with UFO Table's anime adaptation of Koyoharu Gatoge's work. 
and at the rate it's going, it may end up being one of the most iconic battle shonens of all time, let alone for the 2010s. One of the last things I want to mention is that the purpose of this video is not to be a political statement. I don't think these series I mentioned are worth noting simply because the authors are women. It's that these women authors found a place in a genre which by definition isn't supposed to have a place for them. Female mangaka finding a place in the shonen manga industry is remarkable enough because the genre is literally called shonen which aims to appeal to boys and young men, but especially in Battle Shonen, which takes another element of storytelling that's viewed as super masculine, you know, fighting and superpowers, and uses it as a point of emphasis in that same shonen series. I find the cases of Rumiko Takahashi, Hiromi Arakawa, and the various female Battle Shonen mangaka that followed them as a prime example of how a form of entertainment can transcend its target audience or initial purpose, which I think is an incredible phenomenon. When something is meant for a specific subset of people, or is created with a simplistic purpose, but becomes something much greater than itself, taking on more meanings along the way, I think it's a testament to how interesting the world and its people really are. Nothing is as black and white as it seems, and almost nothing is set in stone about the world we live in. And that absolutely translates into the things we watch and read every day. Anyway, that's my video. Thanks everyone for watching. I hope you found this video interesting. My social media stuff is in the description. I'll see you on the next one.